Show everyone, you're here again with another episode of Tzor La Mikra. Uh, we're actually reaching the actual end of the book of Genesis, uh, Sefer Bereshit. And I've actually done quite a few recordings about uh, this parasha. And uh, so it feels a bit of if I'm going to repeat certain things over and over again here. But I know that not everyone gets to those pieces of media, so I'm going to re- repeat certain things that I already said before. And uh, hopefully new audience will be exposed to, the, to these uh, pieces of information. The first thing that has to be said about um, Parashat Vayechi is that it is composed from a very, very large part of poetry. That's really the more towards the end of the parasha. And the parasha is actually a very short one. So the main focus most people have when they teach this is they talk about uh, these prophecy slash poetry elements in the parasha. And um, I've done this quite a few times before. So there's really uh, uh, there's a lot of very, very interesting things in the parasha in general especially with the fact that uh, today some translations are actually really good and they enable us to enable those who can't really read Hebrew to an understand understanding because the difference between reading Hebrew comprehending words and understanding complex uh, structures and elements and that's really one of the things that has to be done when I teach Hebrew is that we need to take classes as well in poetry to understand the the way poetry is structured I'm not going to go into every single thing about poetry today but I will point out some elements here which uh, are very important we'll start off first of all with the concept of Ephraim I know that a lot of people out there uh, see themselves as Ephraim or talk about Ephraim, and I've talk, I've spoken about Ephraim quite a few times before, and the importance of Ephraim, and understanding uh, the position of Ephraim, and also the blessing that uh, Yaakov gives to, to Ephraim and Menashe. And the unfortunate misinterpretations as well of these verses, which are, as I, as I said, un- unfortunate, but mostly as well, uh, manipulation of text to fit uh, certain ideologies which are promoted, which really don't have any uh, any background. I mean, I, I as a scholar, and when I say scholar, I mean an actual person who's gone through university, when we uh, deal with information, especially if we're dealing with literature, because you can be a scholar of different types, but the type of scholarship that needs to be understood here is the relationship between literature culture and history, basically an overall anthropology. And the problem that we have is that today with the way people try to present information, they make a scholarly looking type of presentation with evidence, or sometimes in many cases so-called evidence, and these things are actually connected to more the person's ideology and less what's the te- what the text is actually saying. Now, I'm going to be very blunt. Being completely textual is very difficult because to, to have a text in front of you and say, this is all I have to work with, uh, what it creates is a situation where you're limited to what's given in front of you as a text and you have to deal with also the reality of what was surrounding uh, people at the time, the culture they were living in, things that I've said over and over again here uh, many, many times. And I'm actually in the process of studying a very important book in understanding the Tanakh as a text together with the... Um, with understanding the cultures and the realities that people lived in when the Tanakh was written. And a very important thing that got kept on re- being repeated over and over again is the fact that it's very difficult for us to pierce beyond this veil of how did people think because we don't actually have someone who lived back then living today that can tell us exactly how they, per- and how they perceived things. So there are actually several approaches to understanding this entire discussion uh, or this entire subject of the blessing to Ephraim uh, by Yaakov and what he really intended by saying this and also what do we actually have historically when we look at what was going on at the time of uh, the Tanakh at the time of the of the 12 tribes when the 12 tribes were still sitting on their land. So the subject in question here is first of all the superiority I hope I'm pronouncing that word correctly. There's certain words I have difficulty pronouncing in English. I don't know why. But um, the superior uh, position of Joseph in parallel to his brothers, Joseph is the center of this entire uh, this entire discussion. Before the, before the blessings, 
during the blessings, after the blessings, Joseph is the center of everything. But when we're done with, with, with the brothers themselves, and we actually go into the people of Israel, Joseph just becomes an integral part of the people of Israel. So there's a, there's a message here as well that has to be understood when we carry onwards into the, the, the material presented about the people of Israel in general. But what we have here is the famous story that Yosef goes to his father, now, and, and he presents his sons. Now we need to understand that the way the time is elapsed here in the story, it looks as if everything happens side by side, but really there's quite a few years between the meeting itself, Joseph uh, ruling Egypt, Yaakov aging, Yaakov being presented with the sons uh, of Yosef, and then the blessing itself. It's not immediately afterwards. There's a time elapse here. But we need to understand that that's, that's how the Tanakh works. That's how most stories work, that you don't see everything in real time. You actually have to skip through time. And um, there are... Uh, been actually quite interesting attempts, for example, in cinema, because we say cinema is basically storytelling. Instead of using a written media, we use a visual and audio and audio uh, instruments to to tell a story. And there have been quite a few interesting uh, attempts in cinema to create a one shot movie. There's a very famous movie that goes on just from one from the beginning to then. It's one long shot, and there's a lot of movies where they try to do real time. Um, footage to 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 put people in like a re the reality of the movie itself, but most movies have to do time elapsing. They have to go forward and jump ahead, and a couple of days later, or several weeks later, or even jump backwards, and things of that nature. And here we have to th see it the same way, because it's really the, the the concepts of who we are as people are identical. We have the same feelings, the same emotions, same questions, and same ways of entertaining ourselves. And and I'm not saying the Tanakh is entertainment, but you need to remember that this is also a story that was probably told um, to people, children, adults, by different people, if it's a father to his children or a, a priest telling the stories of Israel uh, to uh, people who come in and ask questions about the people's history. And the Tanakh, is, is the Torah itself is not just the laws, it's also the history and the stories and the morals and, and things of that nature. And basically what we come across here is a... Um, a story that presents an explanation, how is it that Ephraim, several generations later, is such a big element in the people of Israel? And this story kind of gives us the idea of why it happened. It happens to be because of Yosef being uh, such an important part of the family, being the son that Yaakov uh, sees as his continuation, and therefore there's this expectancy for him to be the core of the blessing. But then we also have to remember that Yosef is not the only one. But what's very interesting here is that Ephraim, actually not being the firstborn, actually being the secondborn, is the one that receives this great blessing, which is a, a continuous narrative in the book of Genesis, because um, Yitzchak was not the the actual first son born to uh to Abraham, Yaakov is not necessarily the firstborn, though we're looking at a situation of twins, which is a conundrum legally, a legal conundrum in the in the ancient Near East. And then Yosef is not really the firstborn either. He's actually the firstborn of, of Rachel, but he's not the firstborn in general. So this is a continuous motif here that uh, probably is also trying to break a... Uh, a uh, concept that they had back then that everything has to go through, through the firstborn. And it's actually telling the story, no, the, 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 the right of something goes through he who deserves to be it, not he who, who thinks that he's the most important. So there's a, probably a hint here to the concept of pride and putting pride aside and telling people, listen, the, you become chosen if you do the right thing before God, not because you're a descendant of someone. There's this famous statement in the Talmud that a man who's a Kohen should not go around saying, I'm a Kohen, therefore respect me. You know, he should be respected by the fact that he is a descendant of Aaron, but he needs to also show respect to the to the lineage that he has of being a descendant of Aaron. So it's not enough to say, oh, I'm a great person, I do this, I have this knowledge. There's a humility that has to come with it, and the fact that God needs to turn around and say, okay, I choose you. But going into the text itself, we have... Um, very famous pieces of information, you know, he brings them forward, he asks, who are these? 
And this is a, there's a, the famous question, what does it mean, he, he, who are these? I mean, where he doesn't know who, who his grandchildren are. Well, first of all, he actually was going blind. So there's, there is the possibility that he actually did not see who were in front of him. Okay? Also, what's also possible is that there was a time elapse and the grandchildren were not that common in uh, Yaakov's uh, uh, bedroom, we'll call it, because he was too sick to see anyone towards the end of his life. So he what, maybe he didn't even see his grandchildren over several years or several months and they had already changed. Whatever the case may be, uh, Yaakov is presented by uh, by the by uh, was presented with his two grandchildren. He asks who they are. He's brought in front of them. And maybe the 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 hint here to why he asked this question is because when he saw them, he saw something which others didn't see. He saw something with a Feynman Menashe that he didn't see with the other grandchildren. And maybe he, what he was wondering about was more what is the spiritual aspect of these people in front of me that I see here is something that I didn't see before and I don't see don't see with my other grandchildren. And it's quite possible that this is the situation because he does see that Ephraim will be greater than uh, than Menashe. He doesn't say that Ephraim will be greater than the rest of the sons, but there is already a, uh, the rest of the sons and the rest, the rest of the, uh, the descendants, but there is a hint in the blessings themselves that Yaakov sees Ephraim or he sees the descendants of Yosef as being greater than the rest of the brothers, and we'll point that out later. Now, what happens here as well is that he gives an account in chapter 48, the beginning he gives an account of the history, and this is a very common thing that we find in um, in the deathbed or towards the death of a of a character. This is these blessings and speeches are quite common. Y um, Yaakov is repeating some of the background of uh, who he is, what God he serves, and basically he's passing on this knowledge. As uh, though Yosef probably knows all this, he this is like a final speech that's very common with uh, when when very important characters die and there's a transition from one period to the other. We're transitioning from the period of the patriarchs to the period of the of the sons of the twelve tribes, and then it's quite possible that the fathers of the twelve tribes did the exact same thing to their descendants, to their children, to continue this heritage, and therefore, by doing that, they established themselves also as fathers or as type of patriarchal elements in the people of Israel, and, the, and this is why we have a so, somewhat division between the different tribes, because they, though they recognize themselves as, themselves as Bnei Yisrael, as the children of Israel, not necessarily the sons of Israel, I've already explained that Bnei can also just mean children, which also includes the, the females, but what they actually do as well here is that they establish themselves as patriarchal characters and therefore they see themselves as separate elements. Uh, and this is why there's this whole discussion about the loose covenant, the loose relationship between the different brothers later on. In other words, what I'm saying here is that there are mirrors of what happens in the future to the brothers and the tribes in the stories themselves. And some scholars try to say it's the opposite, that the, that the writers put the reality of where they lived in and the reality surrounding them into the stories themselves. That's not necessarily untrue, but it doesn't discount the historical account presented here. In any case, uh, he accounts the death of Rachel, and um, he in, then he he's uh, they're born in front of him. And it says, V'aynei Yisrael kavudu mizoken, so it specifically says that the eyes of Israel, and now he's referred to as Israel, and this is pivotal, by the way, because when when Yaakov is an element of faith, he's referred to as Israel. When he's an element of weakness, he's referred to as Yaakov. And this methodology, by the way, appears in other places in uh in the Tanakh, for example, the reference to Israel is Tolat Yaakov, the worm of, Is of Yaakov, which is a position of weakness. So it's very interesting to see how these elements, these these traditions of writing, these these 
are, are passed on from one period to the other and actually are maintained. So this is also a very interesting concept that repeats itself over and over again, which shows a, an interesting literary link between the different books, that they were very aware of what came before them, because there were, there were scholars who tried to claim that the Torah was written after the prophets, but really when you look closely at the prophets, the prophets actually referenced the Torah all the time, which means they were very, very aware of the existence of the Torah and knew what was written in it. And I know this is something I've been repeating over and over again, but the struggle, the struggle that a lot of people have is with, with people throwing these pieces of information at them, and there's no critical approach to what's actually being said. In any case, um, they approach him, they, they, they uh, give him a hug, they habek lahem, he, he hugs them, and uh, he, basically what happens here is that they, they, he releases them from his knees, which means they're in front of him, and they bow down to him. And I've already spoken about the concept of bowing down, that they, um, it's more of a sign of respect. What we find here is that it's a sign of respect that's, for example, done inside families. So this is interesting insight into the way is Israelites would show respect to members of family, especially patriarchal members of family. And really, this gives a little bit of insight of what does it mean to honor your father and your mother. You honor your father, but you also honor your grandfather. So father and mother, if I take a slightly more broad approach to the subject, will also be patriarchs in the family and not limited just to your 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 parents is the ones who gave birth to you. But they bow down to him. And this is an interesting thing because a lot of people have difficulty with this idea of bowing down. But if you eliminate the idea of worship and you actually call it bowing down as a sign of respect, again, like I've said before, it is actually no longer a worship. And then what happens here is that he reverses them and he puts his hands on the opposite, on the opposite sons. He actually crosses his arms and... Um, he blesses them and says, I'll read, I'll read the whole thing in Hebrew and then I'll translate. It says in verse 15, Yosef vayomar, ha'elohim asher yitalichu avotai lefanav, Avraham v'yitzhak, ha'elohim aroi oti me'odi ad ayom hazeh, ha'malach ha'goel oti mikol ra, yivarech et ha'nearim ve'ikra vahem shemi, v'shem avotai Avraham v'yitzhak v'yitgu l'arov b'kerev ha'aretz. So, and he blessed Joseph. It's interesting. He doesn't bless the children. The blessing is considered to be a blessing to Joseph because the children are considered to be a continuation of uh, of Yosef. So the blessing of the children is also a blessing to Yosef himself because later on in time, a man is remembered by his descendants and therefore if they are blessed, the the, the, the father is, a, is blessed as well. When a father sees his children succeed, he feels it as being a blessing to himself. And anyone who is a parent can relate to that, including myself. It says, Ha'elohim asher talichu avotai lefanav. The Elohim, it's interesting, he doesn't use the name yud hei vav at all. He actually, earlier on, he uses the name El Shaddai. So in any case, he says, Ha'elohim asher talichu avotai lefanav. The Elohim, which my ancestors walked before him. And walking before him, if we actually look at cases of someone walking before uh, before God, it's always in a very positive manner. So Noah walk, walks before God, it's in a positive manner. Hanoch walks before God, it's probably in a positive manner. So walking is considered to be a very positive element. So they walk before God, and he mentions them, Avraham and Yitzhak. He actually invokes their names, which is interesting. He does this in other situations as well. When he takes the oath with Lavan, he does the same thing. Ha'elohim the, the Elohim that shepherds me. So Ro'e is actually to shepherd. Me'odi adayam azif. Me'odi, from my early beginnings, um, the Me'od, or Me'odi is to say from a very early start. So it's a way it's said in Hebrew, Adayom it to this very day. So he admits to the governing of God over him throughout his entire life, and basically Yaakov is revealing that he is now understanding, later on in life, he is under he understands that what he went through as a person, the suffering that he went through as a person, uh, with, with, with his brother, with Lavan, with losing Yosef, he understands that now that this is something that God governed him. This is an understanding that he reaches. And he refers to Hamalacha Goeloti Mikol Ra. I find this actually specifically intriguing that he refers to as Malach, the messenger, he doesn't refer to as Ha'elohim again. 
And I think that there's a, a recognition here that God also worked through angels, which is something which is quite a repetitive concept in the stories of of, uh, of Yaakov. What it also does here is that Yaakov admits that, or this admits to a, to a theology that God has messengers that he works through. That he doesn't always directly intervene. He actually sends it is direct intervention, but he intervenes through messengers of different types. And it's the Hamalacha Goeloti Mikolra, the angel, the messenger who, who redeems me from all evil. The term Goel, by the way, can be used to indicate something someone who redeems you in different uh, in different elements, because sometimes the redemption can also be something to do with uh, redeeming a member of family. So we need to remember that using a word ha has to be understood through its context. The context of a goel is to redeem, but beyond that, we have um, we have a lot of other elements. For example, inside family, between friends, and, and things of that nature. Now. Um, what happens here? He says, "Yevarechet anarim." Now he says he will bless the child, he will bless the, the young boys. Vikarev v'hem shimi v'shem avotai, and my my name and the name of my ancestors Avraham and Yitzchak will be named upon them. Again, I always say that the whole story of Avraham receiving the the you know, going back to the early stage that we have, which is Avraham, where God says to Avraham that people will be blessed by his name and the concept of grafting in is actually completely incorrect it has to do with understanding the root bet resh kaf understanding how the nif al form is being used there but i keep on seeing a continuous motif here of the name being called upon someone and not necessarily in the sense of grafting in but in, in the sense of being blessed that someone will be blessed by the name of someone and Putting a name of someone upon someone else is a form of blessing. Now, some people say, well, this still sounds like grafting in. There's a difference between grafting in and grafting in means that you actually join the group. But what it actually says here is that a name would be placed upon someone. Here, specifically, these children are descendants of Abraham, and therefore the name of Abraham is anyhow placed upon them, but he is repeating this to strengthen the blessing itself. But what we actually have here is throughout the entire story, is from Abraham all the way to the death of Yosef, we have this concept of placing someone's name upon someone, and therefore I think it clarifies what actually is the statement in the beginning of the book of, uh, sorry, in the beginning of the stories of the patriarchs, where it really means that they'll bless each other to be like Abraham. Um, and he says, and they will, they will multiply, like, multiply like fish in the land. So this really means that there'll be a multitude of them. But then the real punch uh, line here is what he, when he says to him later on in verse 19, they, they kind of dispute over the fact that he swished his hands and he, um, and he, um, he, uh, Yosef uh, protests this and says, no, it's the other way around. He says, I know my son, but he says, and his father refused and said, yadati vini yadati. I know my son, I know. He will also be le'am. Now, am usually means nation, but what he really means here in this context, the way the word am is used, is a large group, a, 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 a multitude of people. Because understand, the word am relates not only to nation. There's a, there's a problem here that the word am and goy are, are misunderstood because they're taking out, taken out of their context. Many of us think of the word am as translated as nation, but really, historically speaking, the word am, the word goy, the word rea, karov, all these words that can relate to nation or relatives, they all connect to the fact that people were relatives to one another. So, for example, when it says, this, uh, this, this person will be cut off from his people, what it actually really means to is, what it really relates to is the concept of being cut off from one's family as well. So, the word am here doesn't necessarily mean nation. Actually, what it probably means is a multitude where the family is highly expanded. We need to think also about the history of how words are used. And the, the, the earliest accounts of such words really relates to the tribal element, which where tribes usually were people who relate to one another, second, third, fourth, and fifth cousins. Well, fifth cousins actually is even bigger than that. But we're talking about second and third cousins. So, when by the way, when people uh, kind of go ooh about 
cousins getting married, this was actually not something unusual in the ancient world because people mostly lived in the area of their family. Many people were actually come in contact with with their relatives. This actually changed after the the known world was conquered by different people and people migrated from one place to the other in massive numbers and they actually lost their tribal structures because, for example, you would have um, people... Uh, tribes traveling from one place to the other. For example, in the 12th century, there's a record that we can see in a massive change in in geopolitical and uh, uh, economic structures in the in the ancient Near East, where entire tribes move from one place to the other, but they still maintain their tri tribal stru tribal structure. However, later on, what we actually have is um, something more complex than that, that in small families will migrate from one place to the other because of slavery, because of uh, a will to find a better life in other places, basically very similar to what we have today. And now most people are not related to one another, and people actually live side by side with people that they are not their relatives. But back then, People lived, if you lived in a village, most of the chances are that most of the village are related to one another unless they had newcomers uh, from other places. Major cities are a different question because major cities broke the idea of uh, tribal structures and people would go and live in major cities and in many cases they'll be related through the nation, not through the um not through the family. But even back then, most nations were actually blood-related. Nations today are a mixture of a lot of people from a lot of different places with migration from one place to the other. In any case, um, and he says, that, and he will also grow, he will also be great. But his younger brother will be greater than him. And his seed will be Meloa Goim full of the nations. Now, a lot of people want to interpret this as meaning that the nations will be full of the tribe of, of Ephraim. This is not necessarily the case. Actually, I would say more than that. That's actually a curse. Now, some people would say, well, he's seeing the future, but and, and he's saying that they will, be ex, they will be expelled, but that's not something that he actually presents in this entire story. It's actually not non-existent here. So to say to Yosef, oh, your son will be scattered amongst the nations, that's actually a curse. That's actually something bad. So if we take the general context of what's being said here, he's actually saying a blessing. So really what he means here is that he will be like a multitude of nations. There will be so many of him that he will be a a, uh, a force to reckon with, I would say, a, a power that's very important. And that's really what happened. If Ephraim was the core, the center of the northern tribes. It was the biggest group, and everyone everyone gravitated around them. So this actually reflects the truth of what happened in the first temple period. Ephraim was the center of everything. Ephraim, or the tribes linked to Ephraim, led everything. And this is, for example, in the book of Joshua and the book of Judges, we actually see this quite clearly. Even the book of Samuel, uh, Ephraim is still a very, very prominent element and leads the northern tribes in a lot of situations. So this is actually a reflection of what really happened. So I, I'm very I, I'm very doubtful. As much as I, I want to, to tell people, oh yeah, you can be Ephraim, I have to say that this is not something you should cling to. I say something else. I say that there's a the, the tribes, the, the tribes, the northern tribes, parts of the northern tribes did arrive in other countries and can probably be found there. But I think that we also need to understand the psyche of people living in the 20th century and 21st century. That there's a there's a identity crisis going on. We have a movement that's trying to demolish identity and tell everyone, oh, we are we are all the same. Versus people who want to actually create an identity. And this identity crisis has been going on for about 150 years, I would say, and it just takes different forms and shapes. So we need to kind of look veer very deeply look very deeply into into why we say certain things and believe me i have no problem with people saying that they're fine really no issue with that i mean if you're going to keep torah and be loyal to the god of israel i really i have no problem with people claiming they're fine but you have to understand that when you claim that you're a fine or a specific tribe later on in the future this actually has a legal meaning you're going to have to have make a claim over pieces of land and if you are not from that tribe you have a problem. But that's not for now. Something will happen in the future. Hopefully, it will be something that by then um, we'll all be redeemed and it will be easier to figure out who's whom. But in any case, 
that's the real meaning of that verse. People who use Midrashim to try to argue this or that, it's already their business and it's something that, that they they want to push. And, I, and Okay, so they can do that. But I don't think that using these verses is correct. I think that the, the, uh, the, uh, the way it's presented is actually incorrect. But this is me. In any case, he calls the brothers over after this this after this after uh, scene, and he actually blesses them. What's very interesting is that the majority of the brothers are presented in a relatively negative way. Reuven is, is presented as a, a the brother who did bad things towards his father. Shimon and Levi are criticized uh, for their violence towards, uh, towards the, uh, the dwellers of Shechem. Yehuda is actually presented in a pretty, pretty positive light. Um, but uh, it takes a few brothers until we actually get to this. So Yehuda, actually, I would say, is a bit of a contrast to Yosef. And Yehuda is actually presented as a very powerful warrior. And he is a lion. He's a gurarie, which means a lion cub. And there's a whole question about what he says here in verse 9. Gurarie Yehuda miteref beni alita. And there's there's this midrash that says that really what he says miteref beni, the 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 um, the hunt of my son you arose, kind of maybe hinting that Yaakov knew that through through the the power of prophecy here, at this point he realizes that Yehuda was involved with the with the selling of Yosef and he's criticizing him here. However, this can also be read as from from and this is how the mass rights put the punctuation. From the hunt, my son, you have arisen, basically presenting him in a very powerful way. And the metaphor keeps on basically presenting him as a lion. And it actually says that, it actually presents Judah as being the king. Joseph is a powerful leader and highly blessed, but Judah is actually the king. And verse 10 says, And that's a whole discussion by itself. And then verse 11 says, And that's a whole discussion by itself. So the... Um, the staff will not be removed from Judah, and the uh, the lawmaker, if we translate Mechokek as lawmaker, from between his legs, maybe descendants. Ad kiavo shilo. So there's a question here, what is this shilo thing? So a lot of Jewish interpretations say that this is the Messiah, and, you know, um, the ultimate thing is that there will always be a continuation of leadership until the Messiah will show up, and then there will never be an issue again. Uh, and nations will submit to him. Uh, new translations, based on new re- and research that was done later on after the old translations, actually say that ad is actually a corruption of something ad 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 shilu. Um, there is a, apparently a, a an Akkadian uh, description that says that they brought tribute um, uh, to him. And uh, this is really some of the new translations translate like this, that it really means that they will bring tribute to him and they will surrender before him. And I actually hold to this translation. And uh, he ties, uh, he ties his, his, uh, his donkey or his ass to, uh, to the vine. And to the again, again metaphors here, repetitive metaphors. Osir lagefin iro l'shreka b'nei atono kebes bayayin levusho uvenam uvedam enavim anavim suto. He ties his animals to these fertile trees, which are usually grape uh, grape vines. He he has so much grape, so much wine that he actually can even his his clothing are covered with the wine, and levusho uh, and suto are basically. Um, same word, the clothing. What's interesting of the word suto is a, is a shortened version of the word ksut, which is um, another word for clothing. And ksut really comes from the root kasa, which is to cover. What's interesting is the, the, the Samaritan text, they actually, the Samaritan text is actually a very late text. People, um, people try to talk about the Samaritan text being the original text. It actually isn't. The alphabet they use is actually has, from the Hasmonean period. Uh, some of the some of the corrections they have there are um, are actually um, uh, show that they actually didn't understand the earlier form of Hebrew and actually had to to update the Hebrew to fit what what they understood as Hebrew. 
Um, I used to say that the Samaritan text is evidence of a very early text, but nowadays after doing more research, I've come to the realization the Samaritan text is actually very, very late. The version that we have in front of us is extremely late and actually does not preserve some of the older forms of Hebrew that we have in the Masoretic text. So the Masoretic text is actually way better than, than the Samaritan text, though the Samaritan text is very important for us for uh, text criticism. But in any case... Um, this wine metaphor is, is quite strong. And really, anyone who's ever been into the lands of Judah, which I've been quite a few times, I actually have made wine there. Uh, the, the altitude and the cold air and the amount of sun, everything produces some of the re really, really good grapes. Um, so in Judah, also in the area of Lachish, which is actually quite lower than the mountains of Judah, uh, Lachish actually has grapevines to this very day. There are depictions of the grapevines of Lachish um, from the uh, from the Assyrian period in the in the pa the palace of Sanchiriv, uh, which have actually seen the original walls because I actually went to the British Museum. If you're ever in England, look up the British Museum. There's some really interesting things there. Uh, but Judah is expressed here mostly by the fact that he is the king leader and he has a blessed land that it produces a lot of grapes. Um, the other brothers are, sh are describing very very short, uh, very very short descriptions. And um, you know they're they they're, they're strong. They have abilities, but Yosef is really the one mostly emphasized. He says Ben Porat Yosef Ben Porat Ale Ain Banot Saada Ale Shul Ben Porat Yosef Yosef is like this like the the very luscious tree, and uh, he is a Ale Ain. He is on the eye of the fountain. His Banot, which are the branches. Tsaada Aleshul, they climb. So it's interesting how the metaphor to to they they march. Tsaad is to march. Tsaada Aleshul, they march upon either a wall or a uh, the floor. It depends. There's a uh, there's a question here which kind of vine he's referring to. If it's a vine that climbs, or it's a floor vine because there actually are several types. But he also says, He is actually being inflicted here by different enemies. But Teshev Beitan Kashtov, he actually is very strong. His um his bow stands with with sturdiness. And his arms are quick to fire the arrows. From the hands of the of the uh, mighty one of Jacob. From there, the the shepherd of uh, Evan Israel, which some of these terms here are a little bit um a little bit difficult, so there's some claims of uh, some claims of corruption in the in the text itself. Maybe again, this is poetry. Mostly poetry was passed down orally until it was written, and then even when it was passed down as a written form, sometimes there are difficulties. So there are uh, some people who claim that there should be corrections in this text. So, for example, um, when it says Misham Roy Even Israel, some people say maybe it should be Mishem. Um, Mishem Roev in Israel, by, from the name or by the name of um, the shepherd, who is also the the stone of Israel, the, the strong the stronghold of Israel, because Evin basically means a place that's protected. Um, and it's interesting that Yosef is the one that actually has references to God. So this is you know, the other brothers are are the, some of them actually have references to God, some of them don't. Judah, for example, um, does not have any uh, does not really have references to God, uh, but the other brothers, uh, some of them do. Um, for example, uh, Dan has a segment there that says at the end, verse 18, Yishod Chakiviti Adonai, to your salvation, I, I, I hope, O Lord. Um, there's uh, maybe with Asher, there's Ma'adanei Melech, the the lights of king, maybe, but that might be just a general idea of the delightful elements of, of kings, um, but in any case, Yosef is the one that actually has the, some of the most important things. He sits on a lot of water, which, by the way, there are a lot of fountains in uh, the lands of Ephraim. He is very strong. He has the support of God. Verse 25, uh, From the, the God of your father, he will come and help, will help you, and, and Shaddai will bless you. The blessings of the heavens above. The blessings of the deeps. Which which dwells underneath bilchot shadayim veracham, the blessings of of breasts and wombs. Basically, he's giving him everything. 
And he says, Birchot Avicha, Birchot Avicha Gavru Al Birchot Torai. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of my parents. Ad Ta'avad Givaot Olam. Well, this is an interesting one. Ad Givaot, Ad uh, ad ta'avad givot olam is an interesting statement, and the, unfortunately, some of these things we don't really fully understand. Um, but some people think that maybe givot olam might be a, it might relate to the concept of um, of the parents. Some people want to say maybe the, the again the verses are not necessarily. Um, are not necessarily um, correct. Maybe there's a, there maybe there are terms that we don't fully understand. I'm actually looking at the moment at some at some um, some people say um, that that you should maybe should be ta'ava should be replaced with the word bracha. Maybe bracha and ta'ava are, are are parallels. And uh, what, whatever the case may be, give otolam seems to be a, again another place of great blessing. Tiana le Rosh Yosef Kodkodin Zirechav will be a, to the head of Joseph, and he will, and to the Kodkod, which is the tip of the head, Nezirechav. Now, Nezirechav, again, is a, an, another one of these terms. It's not necessarily clear to us, but it seems to be that he is exalted above his brothers. That he that he is presented here as being greater than the rest of his, of his brothers. And that's really the emphasis here. It's interesting, the first three brothers, he has to mention them out of respect, so he mentions them, but he actually presents them in a very negative light. Then Judah is really the, the actual beginning of the blessings, and uh, Yosef is kind of slightly parallel to him. They're both the ones that actually get the greatest blessings between the brothers, but Yosef is the one that really is presented, the one that inherits everything. That the same thing with Yaakov, uh, Yaakov uh, sorry, with Yaakov and Esav, that Yaakov receives blessings, Esav receives blessings as well, but the way the blessings are presented to Yaakov are greater than the blesses, blessings of Esav. Same thing is here as well. Binyamin is mentioned at the end here, because this kind of this basically goes in a chronological uh, list of the brothers themselves. So Binyamin is presented at the end, and he basically gives him his decree that he wants them to bury him in the land of Israel. At the at the at the tomb that he uh, that his ancestors are buried in, which is by the way something very important for people in the ancient Near East to be buried. Uh, first of all, to be buried. Uh, one of the signs of respect to your ancestors is to bury your ancestor. That's number one, and number two is also the concept of um, of being buried. Um, in the actual tomb of your family. If you're buried outside of the tomb, there's a certain element of disrespect to the deceased. Obviously, they couldn't always do this because at one point, tombs were full, especially if we're talking about caves, which was a very common way of burying people uh, for many, many centuries in the Bronze and Iron Ages. Uh, so uh, this this was something that was expected because this was what was done. What's interesting is we never hear where, the, where everyone else is buried. Yosef, Later on, we hear is taken to the land. It seems to be that he's buried near Shechem. Um, the other brothers, there's really no history where they were buried. Maybe they were left in Egypt. Maybe their bones were taken as well. Maybe their bones were taken before the Exodus, because they still died at a time. They died at a time where they still had respect from the from the pharaohs. But what's interesting is that we never hear about them. Yosef is the center of everything in these stories, and. The the question is, is Yosef really the one that should receive all the respect? And the answer is, yes, the answer is Yosef should receive a lot of respect from the other brothers. The tribe of Yosef is considered to be a, a leader amongst the brothers, but he is not the only leader. And this is what Yaakov is trying to point out. Yehuda is the other leader as well. Yehuda is actually the one that's given the kingship. And this is very important to point out. Yaakov, specifically through the blessings themselves, especially with putting Yudan and Yosef in parallel to one another, he indicates to each one of them what are your what are your rights here. To Yosef, he says, "You have right of property." He says, "You have right of property. You have right here to inherit the best land. You have the right here to inherit a double inheritance." This is why both of the sons of Yosef receive the blessing because. Yosef is considered to be the firstborn for ya for Yaakov. Reuven loses that right after what he does. He is disgraced, and this was a quite common practice. If a son disgraces the family, he can be removed from his position and even exiled from the family, which is almost given a, a death sentence, but he didn't do that here. Uh, Yosef receives the best land. He is the one that carries the message of the family. He has God on his side and everything. 
But Judah is the one that's given the leadership. Judah has said, you are the king of your brothers. And this is the thing. The message sent out here is that Judah and Yehuda and Yosef should not struggle with one another. Each one of them has his place and each one of them has his position. And the message here is do not struggle with one another. And this message, that we're trying to echo this message throughout um, throughout the throughout time to make sure that the brothers never struggle with one another and it's and you see further on in history further on in the future that the brothers continue to struggle with one, with one another and this is what the prophets say that the Yehuda and Yosef will no longer uh, struggle will no longer fight one another and they'll actually come together so this is echoing something that was probably a tension that existed back then and as we know everything that happens in history has a background the background here is that there was probably a tension between the brothers all the time, and that tension was passed on to the rest of the children. Nothing happens without a background. Everything in history is a development from one thing to the other. And I can I can go on and on about examples of this, but this is one example. I think the tension between the tribe of Ju- the tribe of Yehuda and the tribe of Yosef goes, or the tribe of Ephraim and Menashe goes all the way back to the struggle between the brothers and. Yaakov was trying to settle this by saying, Yosef, you receive this, Yehuda, you receive this. And unfortunately, the message wasn't sent. So, and I will point out, for me as a Levite, I'm less into the argument between Yehuda and Yosef, but because I am considered to be Jewish as well, it's very difficult for me not to be in this argument. But in any case, uh, we have um, the mummification of Yaakov, which a lot of people raise questions about it being an Egyptian uh, practice. And you know what? I understand that. I truly understand that. The question is, what happened to Yosef here? Why did Yosef uh, do a mummification instead of just wrapping his, his father in shrouds like we find in the region of, of Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, how people used to bury their dead, put them in a piece of cloth or something, and then gather the bones. Here he mummifies, and this is a big question. And there could be a hint here that even if you are the leader, the spiritual leader of your people, like Yosef was supposed to be, you still can undergo a certain level of corruption and, and do things you're not supposed to do. And this might be it, because the mummification is a purely Egyptian concept, and it actually has parts to it which are uh, very ritualistic and very religious. And it's possible that Yosef turned around and said, I don't want all this religious stuff, I just want the, the scientific mummification process. But it still shows that there was a heavy influence, a, a, a foreign influence on Yosef. And this actually might be a little bit of criticism towards towards Yosef himself as being uh, as being the one who calls the shots here. And uh, but, we, but we don't hear it. It might be hinted. But in any case, they mummify him. Uh, there's a lot of people who pass criticism on the mummification here that uh, it goes on for longer than what the Egyptians actually did. And I'm going to tell you something very simple. It says here that they they mummified, I think it says here, for 70 days. Okay, it says uh, for the, so it says that they did the mummification for 40 days and they mourned him for, mourned him for 70 days. A mummification process actually can be anything between um, 40 days, which I think, if I remember correctly, is the lower spectrum, all the way to um, to uh, even more than that. But we actually have cases where there are, um, Diodorus mentions that the mummification can also go on for 40 days, 20 days, 30 days, 80 days, 120 days. It can be anything. It's possible here, because we have 40 and 70, it's possible that the 30 days is 40 days of, mummific- of the basic mummification process and 30 days of mourning, which is something that we do here about mourning for 30 days. And the se- and we actually have, with the mummification process, actually 70 days. But in any case, if you ever hear criticism about the length of the mummification, I'm going to say something very, very simple. The mummification process, is te- their testimonies, the mummification process could have variated in different amount of time, depending on how much money the person had, what kind of process they want to go through, the quality of the, of the items, how quickly they have to bury them. So we actually have testimonies of mummification processes going for shorter and longer periods of time. In any case, he's buried in the land. He's brought to the, the place of, of burial. And then the brothers turn to Yosef. They're afraid. Yosef proves to them that he is 
that he is kind to them, that nothing will happen. And this is the message to the descendants of Yosef, to be kind to his brothers. His brothers will identify that they made a mistake and they will be kind to him. And then he'll be kind to them. And this is, again, a message to the brothers to be kind to their brother and the message to Yosef to be kind to his own brothers. And then he dies and he actually gives them, because he is the spiritual leader, he, and he's, the name of God is named upon him, he is the one that carries on the message. And he says, He actually gives the final message that God will redeem you from the land of Egypt. And this is how the story ends, but really it leads us into uh, into Exodus, where the, the term pakodifkod or pakadti, from the root pakad, which really means in this case to remember, because it usually has to do with counting, um, it can also be connected to the word to give a command. It has a militaristic element to it as well, but the concept is to remember, to account for, basically. And this is this is the link that leads us into the book of Exodus. So I want to say thank you to everyone for continuing with me on the book of Genesis. We actually have. Exodus and Leviticus left in this series. I will not be doing um, a double, a double, um, two years in a row. I'm going to do this, and then what I'll do is I'll carry on to something completely different. But in any case, thank you for sticking with me for the Book of Genesis, and I hope you enjoy uh, the next, the next book, the Book of Exodus. Kol